Um, <coughs> good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing work <coughs> done with Jurgen Vinu at CWI. The topic is applying machine learning to pretty printing or code formatting. We've all used code formatters. Some of you in the audience have built code formatters. So what's the problem? Well, there's a couple of ways we can approach the problem. One is we can build the pro a program by hand, but of course this is a very complicated multivariate optimization problem. And a member of the Dart team at Google has a blog entry that I think summarizes it well. The hardest program I have ever written. Now, of course, we're DSL people. Some of you build frameworks. We can relatively easily build a code formatter using these tools, right? So what's the issue? Well, the specification you create is for one language. And these problems, the specification scales with the size of the grammar. So the more complicated your language, the more work you have to do. The next problem is, but that specification is for one language and one style of that language. And of course, we all want our own style. Somebody was talking yesterday about CSS and the you know, 150 different styles there are. So we can either build you know, an insane number of parameters or we can build variations on these things. But it turns out that it's still an unsolved problem. It's a mess. So what we've discovered is that it's actually easier to solve the overall problem than it is to build a specific formatter. Our approach is to use machine learning to build a formatter. And the general strategy is this. You give me a corpus, reasonably consistently formatted corpus. You give me a grammar for that language. And you have to tell me the indentation size so I can capture indentation versus alignment. You don't have to give me any ad hoc code, no pattern to formatting rules. And I will use a statistical model to build a code formatter. You program this by example. If you give me a different corpus with different style, you have effectively created a different formatter. So we chose three different languages for our development process and testing, uh, SQL, Java, and Antler grammars, as sufficiently different that if this formatter could do all of those, then we might have something. So, you know, Squeal is, or SQL, sorry. Squeal is, you know, notoriously difficult to format, and we had a reasonably consistently formatted corpus, a junk drawer that I dragged off the internet somewhere, and you can see it does a pretty good job. Not perfect, but pretty good. The formatter does very well on Java, given a consistent format. You can see that it's highly nested and within different kinds of constructs. Every single white space you see here was computed. It was injected by the formatter. Notice here that it knew to put the elements of a method call all together on one line, whereas here it knew to break them and it knew how to align them. And their grammars are fairly simple, just a couple of subrules, small example, it did a reasonable job. Well, okay, it's not perfect, right? So I searched around and I found a number of examples that are <coughs> improperly formatted, one would say. So for example, here, this really should be indented and ah, you know, probably and should be over there. And then there was an example in the antler grammar, an antler grammar, where it really needed a new line and it did not have one. So how does this damn thing work? So rather than say, all right, when I see an if statement pattern, here's how to format it. Here's a method pattern and how to format it. We're going to mimic a programmer as he or she is entering code. In other words, what white space so it should he or she inject as they are entering tokens, program symbols. So imagine after a semicolon, I might say, oh, I normally produce a new line at this point. And if I do produce a new line, should I align the next line? Should I indent? What do I do with it? So there's actually two canonical white space directives that we've identified 
uh, white space and horizontal positioning. As with any machine learning problem, we have uh, a training process and formatting. The act of training is a matter of scanning through the entire corpus, through each file, and looking at the white space in between two, every two adjacent tokens. And you produce a list of exemplars, which is basically a feature vector that indicates the context, which we'll see a little bit about the features in a second. What context is that token? and what white space is found at that position. So here is a ridiculously simplified version of a few exemplars you might see. After a semicolon, you might have an example where uh, in between a semicolon and an identifier, you'll see a new line. After uh, a 99 followed by a plus, in between there, you might see nothing. After the if, but before a left parenthesis, you might see a space. So unlike most machine learning problems where we are training on a feature vector and saying something simple like, it's a cat, we have fairly complicated categories that we need to predict. We need to predict not only white space, but what kind of white space, how many, and then also for horizontal positioning. So here's an example where I want to capture the white space at that Y. The first thing I notice is that in between the comma and the Y, that there's a new line and there's one of them. Then I realize that it's the, the next token, the Y, is aligned with the X. And how we can refer to that X without knowing anything about the language in a uh, generalizable well way is uh, explained in the paper and it's kind of complicated, but it's cool. Just to give you a taste of the features that we have, we need to know something about the token types in the immediate vicinity. I want to know whether the previous token was on a line by itself or at start of the line. I want to know what my ancestors are in the parse tree and my in and if statement in an if statement. Lots and lots of features that we developed as the process went along. The statistical model we used is called k-nearest neighbor. The easiest way to think about k-nearest neighbor is what I've got with my little uh, fruit example down here. The, the different bananas and the different apples are exemplars. We have a feature vector, in this case, which is very simple. It's got color and length. So for each one of those example fruit, we have a vector in two space. Now, if you have an unknown fruit in your paw and you want to decide what it is, you compute the feature vector for it, what, how long it is, what color, and then you find you scan the exemplars and you find, at least in the k equals 1 example, you find the fruit that is closest to the fruit in your paw. And then you decide that this is whatever that fruit is from your known list of exemplars. Now, these are metric spaces, like the length and so on. When we're talking about token types and you know, Boolean and things like that, we actually have to use a different distance measure we use an L0 distance, which is really how many of the elements of the feature vector are different. And there's a lot of details about how we measure and use this in the paper. I'll skip over that for now. So why are we using k-nearest neighbor? I mean, k-nearest neighbor is kind of the idiot boy of the machine learning world, right? There's no math involved. It's not one of the cool kids. But aside from being simple, it has a peculiar characteristic. It doesn't take the list of exemplars and boil it down to some fancy math. It actually uses the list of exemplars as the model. So it keeps basically the entire corpus in memory as the model. And this characteristic gives us a unique ability. That is, when a k-nearest neighbor classifier makes a decision, it can actually tell you which examples from the original source corpus it thought were relevant to the current situation that you're looking at. So, and this was a critical capability when it came to figuring out what our features are and which ones we need to synthesize 
to get good recognition capability and therefore prediction of white space to inject. Let me give you an example of the tool we built to help us with this. So this is just a, an ugly little Java GUI, but the GUI brings up, it's kind of like a debugger, it brings up the original source and the formatted output. And then when you find something weird, like here, you can click on it. And then it gives you the WS and HPAWS decision-making process. As you can see down here, there's a whole bunch of junk. The takeaway is that it can tell me the file line and column from the original corpus that it thought was relevant. And then I can go look at that file and go, hey, you know, it looks like this, but there's some weird thing right there that makes it actually not really the same context. So you can see that five of the examples predicted that it should align with one token, and then six predicted that it should align with a different token. So it was evenly split. So if I were to fix my model, I would look at all of these examples with an editor, and I would say, okay, can I create a new feature that will separate these so that I get only the truly relevant examples? Okay, so that's how we came up with these features. And um, my experience with machine learning is it's all about feature engineering. If you have the right features, then you can use the simplest model. Okay. So formatting is quite simple. For every token in a file, we are going to compute the feature vector. Now, instead of adding it to the list of exemplars, we compute these feature vectors, like with training, but we present it to the classifier and say, for this context, what do you predict we should inject for white space? And it will give us a, a WS decision, a directive. If that directive includes a new line, then we present the feature vector to the classifier to get a horizontal position. Then we can emit everything. We shove comments out the door. We execute the directives. And then finally, we emit the token text. And then we move on to the next token. There we go. OK. So I want to show you a couple of graphs from the paper that essentially answer the question, how well does this work? And how much data do you need to make it work? So I need a little setup. As I mentioned, we used three languages for our testing, uh, Java, SQL, and Antler. We have multiple Java corpora, corpora that we use. We also had multiple SQL grammars, one for squeal light and one for uh, T-squeal. And then we had a Java 7 grammar that I wrote and optimized for efficiency. And then we have a Java 8 grammar that we took literally from the spec and converted to Antler's meta uh, meta language. So two completely different specifications for the same Java language, and that will become relevant in a second. Okay, so how did we test this stuff to decide whether we had formatted something correctly? Obviously, the human is the best uh, indicator or metric to look at, but we wanted something automatic. And we use something called leave one out cross validation. What this is, is you take the whole corpus and you take one file out, and then you train on the subset corpus, and then you run the formatter on this file that was left out. So the training has not seen this file. And then you format the file using this training. And then you compare in between every two tokens the white space created by the formatter, and you compare it to the actual ground truth in the original file. And then you count how many times it makes a mistake. Compute the ratio divided by the number of tokens, and you have an error rate for that file. Then you get an aggregate error rate if you do that leave one out cross-validation for every document in your corpus. And just to be clear, when we're doing formatting, we are computing and injecting every bit of white space. So we have squeezed it all out before we do any formatting. Okay. Um, uh, I will get to that in the questions. So what we observed 
here on the right, this is the junk drawer of SQL uh, with two different SQL grammars. And it was very inconsistently formatted, and so we got a pretty high error rate. If you have inconsistent formatting, the model is going to be uncertain. After I ran it through IntelliJ, the same corpus, I, IntelliJ formatted the squeal for me. The same corpus with the different grammars gave me a much better, a much lower error rate. The Java Guava library from Google enforces a style programmatically. It was extremely consistent, and it showed that our model was able to pick up that style and get a very low error rate. The uh, string template library was just uh, a crappy little thing that I inconsistently formatted and shoved in there. Okay, so this is saying that the number of mistakes in each file in between the uh, tokens is like 5%. But it doesn't mean that it's actually wrong, right? Because it can, it can be different, but plausible. And that happened in many cases. One of the questions I had was, how much data do we need? And so I ran a simulation where at subsets of size 5, 10, 15, and 20, I extracted a random 5 or 10 or 20 files from the corpus and ran the leave one out validation. It got an aggregate error. And then I did the simulation 50 times per subset size. And so I get a cone, a very tight, because I did 50, I got a really tight cone of uncertainty around this graph, but I'm basically showing the median. And what it says is, after about 10 files in your corpus, it asymptotically approaches the median error we saw on the previous graph. So this means that you can add more files and it will neither confuse the model nor improve it dramatically. A couple of other things to point out. Even for a very large corpus like Guava and with a very large file, it's sufficiently fast to format these files even with a k-nearest neighbor. If we change it out for a random forest, I suspect it will be much, much faster. So uh, briefly, what we observed was that if you take a, say, Java corpus and you format it using the leave one out, and now you swap out the grammar you use to recognize that, you swap out a completely different Java grammar, and you format the files again, and you compare the two sets of formatted files. We found that they're nearly identical on an edit distance basis. That means is, because of the features we have chosen, the formatter is insensitive to the way a programmer specified a language. It's kind of surprising. Um, oh, and then as a real test of generality, we solicited a language and corpus from this crazy guy in Nevada who builds this cool language called Quorum. And we ran it through the model. It was the first time the model or Jurgen and I had seen this data. And according to the author, it had a very good consistent result minus a couple of outlier files. So let me wrap up by saying uh, Jurgen and I think that this is a very big step towards a real universal code formatter. I think some more features are in order and we should swap in a random forest classifier. It's programmed by example. You can have any format you want. Just give it a different corpus. You don't have to write any code. You don't have to build any pattern formatting uh, rules. And finally, I'm really excited to be here because I'm hoping that we can all brainstorm to see how we can apply the fuzzy world of machine language, machine learning to our beloved deterministic language world. So with that, I will answer your questions. So let me answer the quick question about, yes, what about Python?